As the choir was singing and bringing in the atmosphere of praise, that he is good all the time. And I hope those of you who are now joining with us, live streaming YouTube, that you will also know that the Lord is good. Regardless of what is going on in your life, regardless of what's going on all around you, the Lord is still good. Amen. We welcome all of you to the Quinn Chapel Amy Church Hour, where we come to praise and celebrate the goodness of God. We ask of you who are live streaming that you will now connect and click and share with your family and friends that they too may receive this blessing that we believe that God is going to enrich your life. So come now and worship with us together as we come and begin this worship experience today with the call to worship. And the call to worship goes as following. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. O Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth, and sing praises. We're going to sing praises to God right now with our, our opening praise song. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. And as we come to celebrate this song and we remember one of the legends of of the gospel music today, uh, the death of Rance Allen, but we're going to praise because he's a, he was a praiser. And so we're going to praise every praise. Come on, you out there and, and, and the uh, land of technology, come on and sing it with us. You know this song. Get the joy bells ringing in your hearts this morning. Let's sing it now. Oh my God. 
every praise. When you see me singing, every praise. When you see me shouting, every praise. When I lift my hands, every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Come on. Every praise. Every praise. I mean, every one of them. Yes. Every praise is to our God. Let us now receive the prayer of invocation. Oh, Lord, my God, you who are robed in majesty mm. and armed with strength, the world is established by your mercy in your grace even the seas have lifted up praises unto you you are mightier than the thunder of the great waters you stand firm and your holiness adorns your house for endless days so God we come this morning to sing the joy of praise is unto you. We come, God, to shout aloud that you are the rock of our salvation. We come before you with love and humility, with much thanksgiving to extol you and to bring before you music and songs For you are the great God. You are the great king above all gods. In your hand, you hold the entire world. So we bow before you today in worship. We kneel before you, O oh Lord. Because you are our maker. You are our God. We are your people. We are the flock under your care. Please, O oh Lord, help us this morning to reach down in the depths of our souls and express our loving kindness to you that we shall declare your glory among the nations and the people of the world that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless now, Father, our families, this country, and the nations of the world. That today every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are Lord. O oh God, send down your Shekinah glory. Breathe upon us, God, one more time. Your fresh anointing. Refresh us with your Holy Spirit. Empower us with your love. And may we not rob you today of everything you are due from us. Because God you brought us through another week's journey. And now we are here to worship you. We come to worship you God because we have evidence of your mighty hand in our lives. We, we are witnesses, God, of who you are and what you can do and what you have done. So right now, take every element of evil and darkness away from this worship experience so we can have a clean vessel this morning to receive everything you desire to pour in our lives this morning. God, we come to celebrate you. Remove from our minds any evil thoughts, any distraction or detour that 
that we may have a clear channel to receive from heaven's glory. We want to hear from you this morning. We've heard from so many clatters and news that were so depressing and so sad, but we want to hear from heaven this morning. We want to hear words of inspiration and encouragement. So God, we bow down and we lift up our holy hands and we lift up our voices to you, God. Anoint us afresh that we may give you your due service of praise and thanksgiving because there is no other God who loves us and cares for us the way you do. And so God, right now, this service is your service. And we are just worthy this morning to be able to sit here, to stand, and to lift up our joy before you this morning. We believe right now that something good is going to happen in this service today that healing is going to be possible and the miracles are going to be possible and that people dungeons are going to be shake and that chains going to fall off so we are ready now send down your glory for Jesus name to be clad yeah. the world around us will know that there is a God and we say amen and amen amen if you do have your Bibles or your electronic device, and if you go with me to 2 Kings and the Old Testament, 2 Kings and the Old Testament, I will not insult your biblical intelligence that 2 Kings follows 1 Kings. I won't insult your <laughs> intelligence, but 2 Kings, 2 Kings, the seventh chapter beginning at verse 3 second kings the seventh chapter beginning at verse 3 reading from the NIV translation and there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate, they said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk, they got up, went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of the chariots and horses in a great army. So that they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and Egyptian king to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents, their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy <coughs> reached the edge of the camp entered one of the tents and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to one another, what we are doing is not right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them. We went to the Aramean camp and no one was there. Not a sound of anyone. Only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeeper shouted the news, and it was reported within the palace. 
May God bless you with the reading of this holy word. May it enrich your life and may it also give you new revelations about a God who loves us. At this time, we will have our Decalogue, the summary of the Decalogue. Man, amen and amen. Again, we welcome all of our partners. We thank you so very much for clicking on to our worship experience each Sunday morning. And we just thank God for you. And we pray God's richest blessing into your life. We, we thank you for clicking and giving us chat reports. And just keep on clicking and keep on clicking. And invite others right now. It's not too late to share with us in this worship experience. Just a few announcements. Immediately after the service at 11.30 to 12.30 p.m., we will be having our drive-by communion. Also, there will be face masks available, and you may drop off your tithes and offering if you so desire. Two more days, two more days, two more days. Two more days is election day. And if you have not voted, please get out and vote. Don't ever discredit your vote. Your vote is critical to speak about your conviction and your desires for this country. Join us each Wednesday night for our conference call Bible study at 6.30 p.m. You can call the church office uh, for dial-in information, 513-825-4900. Amen. Let us now give and sow seed and to the king. <clears throat> it's time now for our intercessory prayer. One of the things that I'm finding more and more is that people are, are asking as, as we're dealing with all the things that we're dealing with, where is God? Where is he? We're dealing with things and, and some people are just asking the question, so, so where is he? What I want to do is encourage you to know that he's right there in the midst of whatever situation you're going through. He's right there with you. Just like the Hebrew boys, when they went through the fire, there were three of them, but there was a fourth walk in there. There's another in the fire with you, whatever you're going through. You know, even at the Red Sea, there was another one in the Red Sea that parted and made room for them to go through on dry ground. But I want to encourage you today to get your eyes off your situation, as challenging as they may be, and get your eyes on Jesus. I want to read one verse for, to you, and it's from Hebrews, the third chapter, the first verse. It says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. So I want you to get your eyes on Jesus. Get your thoughts and your eyes on Jesus. You know, the more you look at your situation, the bigger it's going to get. Did you hear what I said? The more you look at your situation, the bigger it's going to get. Move your eyes from your situation and get them on Jesus. Because guess what? The more you look at him, the bigger he gets. The more you look at him, the bigger he gets. Remember Peter? He was walking on water till he took his eyes off Jesus. And he started to sink. So I don't know what waves and tides and winds are blowing in your life. It could be sickness, disease. It could be unemployment. It could be a, a relationship that's going the other way, the wrong way. But whatever it is, get your eyes above the wind and the waves and get them on Jesus. And I guarantee you, he is above every name that is named. His name is. So would you just get your eyes on Jesus as we go to pray, as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you for your mercy and your loving kindness. Lord God, we thank you that you love us so much, Father. You love us so much, Lord God, that over 2,000 years ago, Lord God, you knew the situations and circumstances we would be facing this very day, Father. 
You're not caught by surprise, Lord God, by anything we're looking at today, Father. But over 2,000 years, Lord God, ago, you made provisions for us, Lord God. You made a way out of no way, Lord. For you sent Jesus, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. We thank you, Father God, that after Jesus rose from the dead, Father God, he said that all power was given unto him in heaven and in earth, Father. And Father God, you blessed and highly exalted him, Father, for you gave him a name that's above every name, Lord. Father God, we move our eyes from our circumstances and situations, Lord, and we move our eyes to Jesus, Father. We've got our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Father God. For we know we can do all things through the anointed one, Lord God, through Jesus and his anointing, Father. Now, Father, I speak life over your people, Lord God, over your children, Lord. I ask that you'll bless, keep, defend, protect, and provide for them, Lord. Father God, I thank you that you meet all their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I thank you, Father God, that there's nothing too hard for you, Father God. But Lord God, you've always made a way out of no way, Father. And that way is Jesus, Lord. Now, Father, I ask right now, Lord God, that you will encourage the hearts of your people, Lord. That, Father God, they will look, Lord God, not at their situations and circumstances, Lord, but they'll look at you, Father God. They'll look at you, Father God, by having a hunger and thirst for your word, Lord. That, Lord God, regardless of their, what their situations are, Lord God, they will go to your word, Father God, and find your answer, Father God. And once they find the answer, Father God, they'll talk to you, Lord God, as a child talks to a loving father. And they'll ask you for guidance and direction, Lord God, wisdom and knowledge, Lord God, to deal with the situations that are before them, Father. And Lord God, I believe that as you reveal to them by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, what you would have them do, Lord, they will quickly, Lord God, and excitingly, Lord God, obey what you're telling them to do, Father. And Lord God, I thank you, Father, that the victory is already on the way, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that they are already world overcomers, Father. For the greater one lives in them, Father. For greater is he that is in them than he that is in the world. And Lord God, we're anxiously listening, Lord God, for that word, Father. We ask right now, Father God, that you prepare our hearts, Lord. That our hearts will be good soil. That good seed can fall in and multiply and become a harvest, Lord. And that harvest, Lord God, will feed the nations, Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that right now every need of every man, woman, boy, and girl is met in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. We believe that, believe that healing has come. We believe that deliverance has come. We believe, Father God, that provisions are there, Father. That your people, Lord God, will prosper and be in good health, Father, even as their souls prosper. Now, Father, we thank you for your mercy. Lord God, we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you, Father God, for your amazing grace. And most of all, Father, we thank you for your everlasting love. In Jesus' name, amen. If God is dead, what makes the flowers, flowers bloom? Because I know he lives, I know he lives, he lives, he lives, he lives. All right, I went back so many years on y'all, didn't I? <laughs>
Come on, has he been faithful to you? Always providing for me. Great is your mercy for me. Great is your grace. Come on, God. come on, great. I'm so glad I've got a faithful God. Always provide. And He's always providing for me. Praise your mercy on me. Praise your grace. Come on, God.
say yes you are great is your mercy great is your name Great is your grace, great is your grace, great is your grace. Forever faithful, and you're always, you're always, always waiting for me. Great is your mercy. Come on, get your praise on. Get your praise on. Great is your name. Great is your great is. Oh, I wish you could just lift your hands up to the heavens. He's always providing for me. Great is your It's all right to praise him. It's all right to praise him. It's all right to praise him. Nobody is going to bother you if you praise him. Because nobody knows your story like you know your story. And you know how faithful the Lord has been to you. And it's all right to show your gratitude. I mean, if he's really done that much for you, it's worthy to, to give him some praises. If he's really done that much for you, it's all right. You know what he did for you. You know when he did for you. You know where you were when he did it. So it's all right to give him some praise. Great is your praise. Thank you so much for volume. Amen. Amen. As we have been observing what's been going on in the world and what is upon us in the next two days with the election for government officials, it brought me to some R&B artist during the 60s and when at that time we were trying to overcome some of the struggles to claim our rights and privileges that this nation should offer us as well as others. Sam Cook had a song that says that he believed that a change is going to come. And this is a group that some of you may not remember called the Impressions. Keep on pushing. And James Brown came by and he said, I'm black and I'm proud. And Marvin Gaye said a question, proposed a question, what's going on? It appears that what these artists were singing about in the 60s and early 70s, if you close your eyes, you would think that it's the 60s and 70s repeating itself. So today I want to speak in that vein, this message to us, taken from 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? The old King James Version said, why sit we here 
until we die. So today I want to address black America in particularly and America in generally. I want to talk about a sit here mindset. Eight centuries before the birth of Christ, the Jewish nation, which had been unified under the leadership of King David, had now split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. These separate kingdoms were subsequently defeated and some of the people were carried off into captivity by outside enemies. The scripture reference for our text describes an incident during the period when the Syrians swept down upon the northern kingdom and laid siege to Samaria, the capital city. Siege was the ultimate strategy in ancient warfare. If a city could not be conquered by the sheer power of armed forces, because of the strength of the walls, the enemy would simply encamp surrounding the city, cutting off all of its supplies and wait until the inhabitants were starved into a forced surrender. Consequently, Samaria was in great distress. Her people were devastated by hunger. In fact, conditions were so desperate that some of the Samarians were eating the flesh of their own children. Suddenly, the author of Second King shifts the scene. Quarantine outside the city of Samaria walls are four starving, leprous men. They're there now considering their options. Lepers, as you know, were kept in complete isolation in ancient times. So these isolated lepers began discussing their precarious predicament. So they pondered over their options. If they should attempt to crash the gate of their own city, they might be stoned to death. But even if they succeeded in entering, there was no food. Thus, they would eventually die from starvation. On the other hand, if they decided to move toward the Syrian encampment, just beyond the ridge of the hills nearby, where food was plentiful, they would doubtless be killed on sight, not only because they were lepers, but because they were the enemy. Or, if they remain where they are, it was certain death. It was out of this deep distress that one of the lepers spoke to the others about their options. He proposed a question. Why sit we here until we die? If we say... Enter to the city of Samaria, then the famine is in that city, and we shall surely die. If we sit here, we'll die also. So let us fall into the hands of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. Please note that the four leprous men are having this discussion sitting down. We know that they were sitting down because one of the lepers said to the others, why sit we here 
until we die. Also note that the lepers were just sitting, not knowing that God was waiting for them to move. They were just sitting without knowing that if they move with the plan, so would God. They are just sitting, not knowing that if they get up and take a risk of moving, survival could take place in their lives. At that moment, they were just sitting while their demise was rapidly approaching. So they made a decision to rise and go to the Syrian camp. Could it be that there is a segment in black America who are too preoccupied with just sitting? Sitting while too many of our black men and women are unjustly criminalized. Sitting while too many of our children are attending public schools that are rated as being in a state of emergency. Sitting while our communities are still under duress with the outlandish murder rate. Sitting. While poverty is crushing the souls of many children and families. Sitting. While the soul and destiny of our country is in need of their vote to change the trajectory and direction for our future. Sitting. While black America hopes and dreams are dancing with our fears and nightmares. Sitting. While the moral confusion and ethical compromise have become prevalent in the halls of justice and government. Sitting while suffocating social ills are producing cycles of poverty, illiteracy, and widespread hopelessness in many of our families today. Have we become so anesthetized by the continuous social ills in this country? That we've lost our appetite and desire to continue to fight for freedom and equality in this country. Have we lost our zeal and ambition and energy to help to make life better for the next generation? Have we come to the conclusion to say selfishly, just leave us alone? While the foundation and pillars that our foreparents severely struggle to build are under constant attack and erosion. Why sit we here to watch the devastation and uprising of racially insensitive militia groups determined to take us back to the good old days? Could it be that we have looked too long for others to solve the problems for black America that we have developed a sit here mindset. With a sit here mindset, we will continue to do the same thing over and over again without developing the courage to take control of the future of our own destiny. Could it be that the biggest enemy of black America today it's a sit here mindset. If it is, then it must be eradicated immediately or we will continue to lose our influence and power to be the beacon of hope for all of God's people. Have we become too soft and afraid to commit ourselves too much to any one cause or course of action rather than to commit ourselves to commit ourselves to something that we're willing to back with our lives, our jobs, and other symbols of security. Will we rather drift along on the misty flats of indecision where we don't make any choices but allow others and circumstances to make decisions for us? Every person ought to live for something and possess some basic principles beliefs and convictions that he or she is willing to die for. Our voice and our vote are too crucial for us to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. We must speak up and we must vote our conviction 
The time is more crucial than right now. Beloved, the question before us right now is, why sit we here in complacency and contentment when there's more work to be done? Why sit we here and watch all of our gains to be wiped away from us? Why sit we here and watch the struggles of our foreparents who did not mind for them to sacrifice their security and safety for the foregoing of the future and the future of the generation? Why sit we here and be in vain of the struggles of our parents? Beloved, there are three things that I care to suggest for us in helping us to eradicate the sit-here mindset that's impacting the future of black America. The first thing I suggest to us in helping us to eradicate the sit-here mindset is to stop justifying our inaction. Stop justifying our inaction. As the four lepers pondered over their predicament, they could not find a justification for inaction. As they discussed their plight in life, they could not find a reason to do absolutely nothing. They could not find a sound reason for them to just sit idly by until they die. So they made a decision to take action and have control over their lives as small as it may have been. They could have found an excuse to do nothing by justifying to themselves, look, we are just lepers. We might as well sit here and die. They could have found an excuse to do nothing by justifying it to themselves. Then look, there are only four of us. What can we do against a mighty Syrian army? We might as well sit here and die. But they made a decision to take action, and it proved to be the best decision they ever made. Many of us will miss opportunity because we major in justifying why we cannot do, why we won't do, why it's too impossible to make a change for the better. The decline of any nation, any race, any church is when they are set on justifying they're in action when a decision for action is crying out to them. Faith always demands a decision before it can work. To move from dying to life, you have to decide where you would rather be because your decision determines your destination. Stop complaining that you are too small to make a difference. Stop complaining that you don't have enough to work with and being a change agent for the Lord. Most of us have found ourselves saying, if only I had this, if only this was different, if only I had more money, if only, if only, if only. Do you not know that the Lord knows how to work with small things? To do big things for his kingdom? Did he not take two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000? Did he not take a slingshot and put it in a teenager's hand and kill the giant by the name of Goliath? Did he not take a jawbone of a donkey and put it in the hand of Samson and kill over a thousand of Philistines? Did he not take a staff? and put it into the hand of Moses and divided the Red Sea? If we are going to eradicate the sit-here mindset, then we must stop justifying our inaction 
and make excuses of what we don't have. We must use what we have, do what we can, and then let God do the rest. It is no time for us to try to justify our inaction when the world is going to hell in a handbasket. It is time for us as black America to not sit idly by and say I'm not going to vote. You need to get your skippy butt out of your house and go down there and stand in the line. If our people and your grandfather and your grandmother can stand in the line for hours just to be able to get the privilege of voting. You need to get up out of yourself and go and vote. The second thing I suggest to us in eradicating the city mindset is this. Whatever we are willing to tolerate we will not change. Whatever we are willing to tolerate, we will not change. The four lepers come to a point that they were unwilling to tolerate sitting still and die where they were. One said to them, why sit we here? Till we die. Whatever we are able to tolerate, we will not change. If we are able to tolerate mediocrity, doing just enough to get by, living beneath our potential, satisfied with low expectation, then we will not change. Until we arrive to the point that we have had enough and we're not tolerated any longer. All mixed up and permanently set. If we are going to eradicate the sit here mindset, then we have to change our perspective, change our attitudes, change our thinking about the mission and purpose of our destiny. For a world at its worst, we need a people at its best. For a world full of sin, we need a people full of godliness. For a world full of sadness, we need a people full of joy. For a world full of darkness, we need a people full of light. We need a people that's going up and not going down. We need a people that cares about all of God's people. We need a people that's full of hope and pride. We need a people that's willing to sacrifice for a better future. We need a people who is willing to heal, to encourage, and be our brothers and sisters keeper. We need a people who are dressed up in work clothes. We need people that places her trust and confidence in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. We need a people that will illuminate the will of God. That every life is sacred and made in the image of God. We need a people who calls themselves black America to rise and say to ourselves, we are not going to tolerate any of the systemic racism that is permeated again and raising its head in every nook and cranny of this country. We need a people who is willing to rise up and say no more, no more, no more. We need a people who will reach down in the depths of their soul and find some decency and pride in themselves to stand up and realize that I am somebody. We need a people who say we will no longer tolerate taking us for advantage because whatever we are willing to tolerate as a people, we will not change. And thirdly and last, I suggest to us in eradicating this sit here mindset, it's to simply get up. Take a risk and take black America to a higher level. 
get up, take a risk, take black America and this country to a higher level. One of the lepers said, why sit we here till we die? So in the twilight, they rose up, staggered along till they came to the camp of the Syrians. To their amazement, they saw no one as they drew near. No one on guard. No one near the doors of the tent. It seemed strange to them. And at first, they thought everybody was asleep in the tents. To their surprise, the Syrians had left their tents, fled back to their homes, leaving food, water, wine, clothes, silver, and gold for them to find. Because God had already been there before they got there. The point is this. The four lepers would not have received their blessings if they had not taken the initiative to get up from that sitting position to take the risk of doing something about that dying situation. Talk to me now. Look at it. The blessing had already been set because God had already been there. But they would never have received the blessing if they were not willing to take a risk and go toward the Syrian camp. Could it be that black America is in a state of complacency because it has adopted a sit here mindset fueled by being satisfied and looking back on the past 